Hey, Foot Clan, we're breaking down the AFC South on today's special Saturday episode of the podcast. Jason and I go back and forth finding some values in the division. We pick our winners. Make sure you like, subscribe, and tune in. Hey, this is John Taylor, running back for the Indianapolis Colts, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Saturday, July 10th, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Back with you. Jay Grizz is in the house once again. Jason Moore is here. Hello. My best friend. Aw, he's too kind. We do have, uh, we don't have Mike. He's almost back from his uh, barefoot backpack trip. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Feet are going to be destroyed. Yeah, but he's had a great time from what I understand. And he'll be back for the Tuesday show. We are in the midst of some divisional breakdown episodes. Al Borland, Judge Giamatti in the house as well. hey well, oh, that, that was nice. Brooks bringing the fire I today. I thought I was going to have to put it on the tee like, how are you doing? But you just came in with oh, the hail. Screaming at us. But uh, how are things going, Mr. Moore? Pretty well, pretty well. Um, you know, our every everything in Phoenix is great right now. That's true. Uh, didn't see you out at the basketball court last night. I was playing no, some ball, some b-ball with my friends. You played b-ball. I chose to live. And so these were the choices we made because had I gone out there and played for longer than – wait, full court? Full court. Longer than 30 seconds. I'm dead. Here's the trick that I've learned because I, I go out there and I play, and, and I'm I'm 37 years old. And everybody out there is mostly like 28, 29, 30, somewhere in that range. Some of them in incredible shape, like physically, you know, muscles and stuff. I you, remember heard them. that. Yeah. Um, they've got all those just as tired as I am. None of the, it doesn't matter how many muscles you are, have. Full court basketball is not made for people to play. Yeah. I, muscles take oxygen and all that yeah. science. That's, that's why I choose to not have them. But there are plenty of cherry pickers out there. See, I cherry pick on defense. Right. I mean, you could come down and just stand at one end of the court. Yeah, but, I, but I'm going to choose to play defense. You're going to go the defense oh, side? Oh, absolutely. That's probably the, I hate that's the more helpful cherry for the pickers, team. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, quick question for today's show from Instagram. Brian wants to know, do you like to use a late-round draft pick to grab the backup running back to your RB1 as an insurance policy, or do you view that as a wasted pick? I have adapted and changed over recent years in my views for these insurance running backs in the draft season. Now, these, I think we can universally agree. Once you're prepping for the playoffs, you look like you're set there. Uh, strategy will change. You'll grab maybe an extra defense to prepare, which you would never draft two defenses. And you grab your insurance policies because you know you're going to make it. And in draft season, you know, usually I've been against drafting your backup to your main guy. But I have found, depending on how your your roster construction goes during the draft, that there is a situation where I'm really comfortable grabbing my backup for my starter, and that is a that is a roster construction where I end up really loading up on wide receivers, and I've got to, you know, basically I take, maybe I go running back, running back in the first round, first two rounds, and then I don't grab a a lot of depth at running back. At that point, instead of taking some meandering, uh, mostly worthless, you know, Giovanni Bernard pick that maybe he'll catch the ball or whatever, I'd rather grab Chuba Hubbard if I'm the Christian McCaffrey manager and kind of lock that position in. I will say that my answer is I rarely will do it, but there are certain situations with certain running backs that I would. So – and I was going to lob you some of them, but an example would be like if I'm the Raheem Mostert manager, I'm taking a late round shot on Trey Sermon. There's no questions asked. Now, maybe you would say that that 
you know, does that count as an insurance back or do you view Sermon beyond that scope? Like, do you view him more in the Gus Edwards realm? Yeah, the problem with saying that you take a late round flyer on Trey Sermon is because Jeff Wilson is out of the way, Trey Sermon will be involved. He's currently getting drafted higher than, you know, those super late round guys. And and I think really as this as the height train goes. Round. Okay, so you're thinking, you're just talking about a full backup in the last round. I'm probably not doing it. Because what are you, you saying when you make that pick? You've got to hold on to the player, which you won't. Nobody does. I mean, unless you have a, unless you stumble into a first, second week injury and you're the lucky one with your back, like Chuba Hubbard. So here's CMC comes out. He looks fine. You think you're going to lock your roster spot up with Chuba Hubbard? No, I'm, I'm not. And that's something that people need to uh, adapt their mindset on. We talk a lot about your last round, your last two, maybe three round picks taking a look at drafting someone where you will know week one, are they going to break out? Are they involved in the offense? Did their role do what the coaches said, or was that all just smoke and mirrors? That way, week one waivers, you can drop those guys. I, I am fine drafting Chuba and then moving if there's another running back in week one and just cutting Moving him on. if need to. Here's a name that I would look at that you can get with your last pick. You can get Tevin Coleman with your last pick. Do that. Uh, he. Is he an insurance policy? He's the no, starter. No, I'm, I'm just giving you a late round. So you would take him over the, the insurance policy, you're saying? I'm saying that if you drafted Michael Carter earlier, Tevin Coleman with your last pick to see how things shake out is a good pick. You will get to see the payoff in week one and whether or not for some reason he – what if he comes out and he's the guy? What about a Tony Pollard or an Alexander Madison? Are you grabbing them at the end of your drafts if you invested in Ezekiel Elliott and Dalvin Cook? Yeah, but with the same short-term view that you had with Chuba Hubbard. Uh, you know, Pollard's had some good games, but I I just think it's going to be really hard for people to hold any of these guys. You don't want to have to go compete for them if your guy gets hurt, but that's true of every single player on your team, right? I mean, if anybody on your team gets hurt, you'll wish that you had the backup that everyone's going to rush to to the waiver wire. I just wouldn't build too much of my personal strategy around that. And, and I, I agree. So in conclusion, to wrap it up, all in all, That's as, the end of the show. as we would say, um, this isn't something you need to focus on targeting. You sure. don't need to target your primary running backs backup. If that turns out to be the best option late in your draft, it's a fine pick. Be willing to move on from him. But this isn't something where because you draft CMC, you have to leave that draft with Chuba. And I would not draft other people's backups in an or in order to trade them to those players. No, that never works out. No, cuz you will just drop them and then they'll sign. Well, but them. then but you're especially unwilling to drop them because that other person looks you in the face and says, "I'm just going to pick them up when you drop them." And you're like, "I'm I'll, you're ne stuck. I'll never drop them." You're and stuck then, in the trap. And then 4 weeks later, you're forced to drop them and you wish you did it 3 weeks earlier. So yeah, don't draft other people's unless you're in Best ball. Best ball's – this is redraft uh, keeper league focus. In best ball, I would draft other people's uh, backups. Sure. Yep, yep. And um, obviously it changes as well in dynasty leagues where, you know, you might want to have more insurance. I wish I had Chuba Hubbard in my dynasty yes. league. Yes. Or Tony Pollard if you're the – you know, you have Ezekiel Elliott. You, do you have Tony Pollard? Unfortunately, a very rich man did not – Give up. He didn't Tony include Pauly. him in the deal. I tried. That was really the deal breaker where we broke off communication once and decided we weren't going to do the trade because I wanted Tony Pollard. He so was just unwilling. To, just to, I want to make sure people understand what we're talking about. Jason and Brooks made a trade. Ezekiel Elliott, Devontae Adams were two of the big components in the trade. Jason getting Zeke. And Brooks, you wouldn't include Pollard. I said I I would really want to try and keep Pollard find a deal with Zeke that I could get that I can keep Pollard. And so in essence, what I'm what I'm getting at here is Brooks is going for ultimate dunk mode. Oh yeah, because if he kept Pollard, full three sixties dunk on my face. And if. so Rogers comes back. Adams is great. Zeke's done. Pollard rises to the top. Brooks jumps all over your body. Yeah, Rogers comes back. Zeke gets injured. And I and me and Brooks are switching seats, right? Because you're dead. I'm dead, and he's he he knows everything. All right, no news to talk about on today's episode of the show. Like I said, Mike will be back for Tuesday, Thursday next week. We'll be right back into more divisional breakdowns. We just did the AFC North on our last episode and discussed, debated the Ravens, Browns, 
Steelers, and Bengals. So check that out, Thursday's episode, if you want to listen to that breakdown. Today we're into the AFC South, so let's get going. Let's get divisional. Let's begin with the division winners. Two teams had the same record at the top of the division last year, but the Tennessee Titans were the winners. That being said, Jason, the Tennessee Titans are not presently the Vegas odds on favorites in terms of win total. Does that surprise you? Um, it, it... Cause this is a division where here's the hint for you. The Texans are not in competition for that division victory right jacksonville's not in competition correct this is not a powerhouse division this is two good teams two bad teams um and it does surprise me a little bit post julio that they wouldn't be the favorites but i mean pre julio i certainly would not have they, they were too thin at too many important positions for me to have the i, I would have had the colts as as the division leader so the titans are uh because you love cars and wins the titans are 11 and 5 or were eleven and five, as were the Colts. What do you think their win total is set at this year? At a, a top of your head, um, nine and a half. Nine and a half is the answer. All right. I have no idea whether you cheated. Though. I did not cheat. Okay, Scouts. but I have no idea whether you'd admit to cheating. Uh, sometimes it would, sometimes it wouldn't. But Scouts honor on that one. Okay. Uh, were you a Boy Scout? No. Okay. Does that does that mean something? I don't know if it, I. I would imagine that that Scouts honor thing means it means, means more if you were a Scout. Oh, okay. Um, on our, on my honor. <laughs> okay. No, I believe you. That's okay. good. All right. The Titans last year, another one of those teams that, you know, it's not a surprise if you had a great record in the NFL, you were good in one score games, but they were seven and two in one score games had the best turnover differential in the NFL, which is interesting because they had a really, really bad defense. I mean, they were, they allowed the second most passing touchdowns and fourth most passing yards per game. Um, it wasn't good. And I think that's exactly what you're staring down when you look at Vegas picking the Colts to win this division is you're looking at a defense that was really, really bad. And so it begs the question for fantasy purposes for the offensive side of the football with this hyper-efficient offense we've seen over the last two years in Tennessee, Ryan Tannehill, A.J. Brown, Julio Jones, Derrick Henry, is the poor defense on this team going to force them to continue to put up points and make this – give us another year – of sunlight for the Titans because efficiency is tough to come by second in rushing attempts last year, fourth in pace of play, fourth in points per game. And that's the headline, right? Are you expecting a top five points per game this year with Julio and full? Um, I, I think it should be more of the same. Yeah. I know it's been really efficient two years ago. We talked about, there's just no way the red zone efficiency could stay there. And then it, it didn't necessarily stay there, but it was still way above average. This is a highly effective team at scoring, and I think the defense has improved. Um, they spent a lot of capital this offseason. Uh, they, they let Corey Davis go. They let some offensive pieces go, John U. Smith, and they've shifted their money and their focus to the defense because they saw that being a problem. Their cornerbacks still are uh, non-existent. I mean, their secondary is bad. So, yeah, they're going to need to score. Um, my big concern for the Titans, because when I look at the Titans holistically and say, this offense, are they going to be good? Are they going to be bad? I think they're going to be good. I mean, they, they hit 73% of the time last year. They hit the over. That was the highest in the NFL. They were a surprisingly good offense. I think they will be a good offense again. My big question mark, though, is the offensive coordinator change with Arthur Smith exiting, going to run the Atlanta Falcons. I worry now, you know, they hired in-house and brought up someone who was already here, so you hope it just stays the same, but I'm not... The last time we saw Todd Downing yeah. was 2017. He did real good. With the Oakland Raiders at the time, and he, they were 31st in points per game. So, I mean, there's a reason he wasn't an offensive coordinator in the interim. So, yeah, I mean, he was with the Raiders organization for quite a while. I have the same concern that you do, is the the kind of... Uh, unexpected there. I think I think Janu did um, did a lot for the offense versatility wise mm -hmm. in the in running game as well. Some different looks there, so that that would be a concern. You know, speaking of that turnover differential, the reason that exists is not because their defense was outstanding. It's also because Ryan Tannehill was effective and didn't throw interceptions. The last two years, six picks in 2019, seven last year. 
you know, it, it starts and ends with Ryan Tannehill executing the play action pass offense, 33 touchdowns last year. The year before, he was at a 7.7% rate, which is kind of, you know, above league average by a wide margin. Last year it dipped, but not too far, 6.9, which is still very high. You know, all those years in Miami, he was in the fours. But, I mean, this is the kind of offense that you can expect that in. It's the same way you expect Russell Wilson to have a, a nice touchdown percentage in Seattle with DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. Yeah, when you have Derrick Henry and the defense is really trying to stop the running game, and then you have a great outside receiver like A.J. Brown and you add Julio Jones, you're going to be efficient throwing touchdowns. Um, and, and here's the truth. Ryan Tannehill, he's hashtag good. He's a good quarterback. I, I believe he is a top 15 real-life NFL quarterback. Um, and so I that's why I, I like this roster. I like A.J. Brown. I like Julio Jones. Um, if I had a worry with the players, with the fantasy options that you're drafting, it would solely be Derrick Henry just because of age and volume. And at some point we know historically they – you just don't keep getting 370 plus carries forever and then you know have a better season than next year. He will not be as good as he was last year. There's no chance. Um 2027 rushing yards last year. Right. I mean it's it would take him an amazing year to be better than that and it's 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 not going to happen. Um He averaged 5.5 yards per carry on first and 10. That's so, insane. So if you give him the ball on first and 10, you're you're sitting second and four. And do you get to run your offense? That's why you win downfield. If you can go second and four, and you don't know whether you're handing to Derrick Henry or, or going over the top, it's just a cheat code. It really is because it, you get those big rollouts. Um, let's talk about the passing game, though, because there has been turnover. Corey Davis departed. Julio Jones, they signed him. You talked about Johnny Smith. Anthony Ferkser gets some attention in the uh, passing game as well. Julio comes in with a career average of 132 targets a season. That's what Julio's done um, in Atlanta. Last year, Corey Davis was pacing out for about 117 over 17 games. Uh, so there's, you know, there's the void of Corey Davis there. John U. Smith had 65 last year. Those two guys are gone. Um, what do you expect from Julio? What are the expectations for A.J. Brown? And then I will bring up Ferkser just because they utilize the tight end. And you'd be surprised. I mean, Anthony Ferkser was in the 50s in his target totals last year. Johnny was at 65, more explosive, more dynamic, better athlete. But they weren't that far apart is what I'm saying. It's like Ferkser was a part of that passing game at the tight end position. But let me know, what do you think about, you know, big plays and what you will see from those two wide receivers? Yeah, I mean, the reality is they're, they're a 1A and 1B, and they're going two rounds apart. So I actually prefer the value this year of Julio Jones over the value of A.J. Brown. For A.J. Brown to go as the seventh wide receiver off the board, even after Julio, you're saying that he's going to be, you know, you're when you're drafting a guy there, even though it's after five, you're drafting him because you think this is a top five type of NFL wide receiver. I don't think he does that with Julio on the field. Seems hard to expect. Right. This is not Corey Davis. Julio will demand targets. He will get targets, and he will do a lot with those targets, which – eats up yardage that just can't go to A.J. Brown, whereas with Julio being in the fourth, being outside the top 15 wide receivers, um, right now my rankings, I've got A.J. Brown at wide receiver 13 and Julio as the wide receiver 16. So I still have A.J. Brown ahead of Julio because of touchdowns, um, but I would say the draft value is more in Julio's favor. Do you think that Julio will catch more passes? Do I think he'll? No, I don't. I, I do think he is the number two. Um, in in targets, I have him with ten fewer targets than AJ Brown. That was the yeah. I was curious what you thought there. I don't. I obviously don't think that the team is looking at it through that kind of um lens, right? They're not looking at it through okay, AJ is the one, Julio's the two. Mm -mm. Probably the opposite. It doesn't matter. They're looking at it as who's open, who do I want to go to right. on this play, which which cornerback that stinks is guarding which guy this week. You know, it, it, that's the thing. It's going to go back and forth. So I think there will be some consistency issues with those two wide receivers. Yeah. But I'm not too worried about that because we've talked about this before. All wide receivers have major consistency issues. Um, and, and to speak to Ferkser, that was cute for a minute pre-Julio. Ferkser is not even on my radar. I mean, like you said, it's surprising, right? Because he was in the 50s for receptions last year. That's a pretty good number. And it's surprising because he did nothing with them. 
It's just he was irrelevant last year. Yeah, I mean, you really can't argue with that. He didn't score any touchdowns. I mean, he was 41 reception, 400 yard, one touchdown pace. Just bringing up his name because people are always looking for late round diamonds in the rough, and you're saying, Ferk, sir, this isn't the forget division. About it. This isn't the division for tight ends. That's what I'm saying. We're going to talk more about this division. About how few tight ends are in this division. So you're, what you're saying, uh, by extension, is that Tim Tebow could be like a defining tight end in this division. I mean, if he's going to be in any division, this is the one. All right, let's take a quick pause. I'm going to jump into the Colts here, but I want to thank today's sponsor, Uncommon Goods. Jason, what is Uncommon Goods? It is, well, actually, it's better if you just go and check it out because I can't explain to you how many different unique products they have on the website. There are, like, so many times you have gifts that you need to give and you don't want to be boring and you don't know where to find something unique and literally Uncommon Goods is the best possible place. Uh, my wife is into plants. I found tons of unique individual like planters on there. I got a murder mystery game box that we all played from Uncommon Goods. Oh, that was from there? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. There, You'll like this. There's there's these Moki ice cream kits on there. I do like ice cream. Uh, Himalayan salt tequila glasses that are really cool. Okay. Um, they make avocado huggers, which when you cut an avocado in half, you know how it gets all brown? Mm -hmm. It's like a little silicone thing that goes over the top of it. There's like hundreds and hundreds of gifts, and there's really cool things for like bridal showers and weddings if you want to be the not generic guest at the wedding. Um, high quality items, often a lot of them are handmade. You can check them all out. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash footballers. That's uncommongoods.com slash footballers for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer to check out all their unique items. Uncommon Goods were all out of the ordinary. You want to know what is um, maybe even better than getting cool gifts for other people? Getting them for yourself? Getting cool gifts for yourself because you're a champion. And listen, Footland, this year you're going to win championships because you're listening to this podcast. You probably won them last year. And Fantasy Champs is the place for Fantasy Champs. It's in the name. It's li this, is, this is easy to figure out. If you're a fantasy champ, you want to get the best trophies, the best rings, the best belts. You want to make sure that you walk into the room at your draft party. No one can even look at you. They're embarrassed about all the bling you have on. Look, when you're a winner, you want to show it off. I know this because we have bought way too much Phoenix Suns gear lately. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not it's not inside of our control. I just It just happens because I want to brag about being a winner. Yeah, so we just want you to know where to go. We we want you to go to fantasychamps.com when you're looking for your championship belts, rings, trophies. And right now, you can get the $60 championship bling Super Bowl style ring for free when you get a trophy or a belt. Just get one of those and put the code free ring in at checkout and something for your league, something for yourself, fantasychamps.com. All right, we're on to the Indianapolis Colts. They also finished 11-5 and five last year. They actually have the Vegas' uh, Vegas's highest win total in the division. They have them at, what do you think, Jason? Do you know this answer? I already? don't know this answer. I would say 10 and a half. 10. Okay. Yeah, so just above, half a game ahead. Last year was interesting. I mean, 11-5, and five, Phillip Rivers leading the show. Um, a great defense last season. They were second in defensive rushing yards given up. Um, really weird schedule. This is a crazy quirk that Kyle found for the Colts last season. According to the final betting lines of each game in 2020, the Colts were the only team to be favored in 15 of 16 games. So they were only an underdog, according to the spread, one time in the whole season. And it was a one-point underdog in Week 5 in Cleveland. So they lost in the wild card round. It was another close game, 27-24 with Buffalo. Um... Ninth in points per game last year. Like, this is the part of the show where you give praise to Phillip Rivers. Uh, nope. They were 10th in rushing attempts. I, I will say this. Phillip Rivers protected the ball, which he had not been doing over the last several years. Sometimes he'd yo-yo back and forth between a year where he was protecting it, but a couple of 20 interception seasons recently. And they then call that a Winston, but go on. Yeah, and then he only had 11. Uh, that was really the story for the Colts last year. They caused turnovers. They didn't turn the ball over themselves. You win that battle, you're going to win games. And this is a very well-rounded, deep team. Um, most positions on both sides of the ball are pretty well-constructed. I, I, I love their GM. 
Uh, I think there's a well-run franchise. The love whole their head coach, Frank Reich. Quest, I love their head coach. Another turnover. I mean, you have more turnover at the offensive coordinator position again this year. Yes. Um, the Eagles were like, oh, man, we shouldn't have let Frank Reich go. Can we have a piece back? Yeah, Nick uh, Sirianni out, Marcus Brady in. But um, the, the, the question of the Colts is – I mean, we, we, for fantasy, we've got questions on the wide receivers and on Jonathan Taylor and whatever, but when we're looking at what are the Colts going to be as a team, it's just Carson Wentz. What, they're going to ride or die with Carson Wentz, and what do they do, Andy? I think they ride. They're my pick for the division. And, you know, Phillip Rivers, you, you brought up, oh, okay, it wasn't an interception year for Phillip Rivers. You know what has a lot to do with that? Offensive line? An offensive line. And, you know, they. Yes, I got it right. Yeah, you got it right. I mean, they're going to need to protect Carson Wentz. Not, you know, maybe more than anyone before, just for the fragility and the confidence of Carson Wentz coming into a new team, trying to reprove himself as a franchise quarterback. But I think they can get it done. And they were, they were the number one defense for fantasy last year. So that kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, that being said, Jason, you get some credit. You had them as a streaming defense to target before the season began. Uh, so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. But look, the offensive line rank going into 2021, according to Pro Football Focus, is number two overall. So if you want to, if you want to write the story of Carson Wentz, it begins like this part of his career begins with this kind of a situation. You put him in a position where he can succeed. However, does he have the wide receiver pieces to succeed or is he being dealt another hand like he had in Philadelphia? Because the Colts wide receivers were the fourth lowest in terms of wide receiver target share. The ball was going to the tight end position a ton last year. There's a lot of talk about Jack Doyle having to stay in and block a lot this year uh, to help solidify that oh, offensive line. Oh, Mo Alley Cox. And He's yeah. gigantic. Yeah, so maybe Mo Alley Cox is a sleeper there. But T.Y. Hilton. He's going in the 12th round of drafts. Michael Pittman's going in the 11th round. That does seem anomalous for a team that was ninth in points per game to have no pass-catching options inside the top 10 rounds in fantasy football. That's crazy, right? Uh, it's, it's unique. It's not a normal situation. Uh, the, you have the running back going inside the first round and Jonathan Taylor. So this is a team that at least fantasy analysts seem to be projecting a complete run first pass second type of offense. I don't know that that's going to be what they're able to be um, this season. And I think this offense uh, and and whether Carson Wentz rides or dies really is going to rely on the is, if T. Y. Hilton is washed or not. Because if T. Let's just say because Mike's not here, and I will speak for Mike. Mike is O U T on T.Y. Hilton. The way I am on A.J. Green, I just think they're done. They had great careers, great players, but um, you know, Mike thinks T.Y. Hilton is is not ever going to be a, a true wide receiver one for an what? NFL team from here on out. And if that was the case, just going down that narrative, because I think there is a, a, a decently high percentage chance that, that T.Y. Hilton is not the guy he ever was um, before in his youth, and, and if that's the case, this is not going to go well for Carson Wentz. You can't have Michael Pittman and uh, you know a usually injured Paris Campbell as as your receiving core. Um, I actually disagree. How? Because I don't think I I think a new narrative for the Colts should be it doesn't matter about about T Y Hilton. I think that I think that last year you were ninth in points per game and you didn't have T Y Hilton show up for almost the entire season in terms of productivity. What I like about Frank Reich in the offense is you got to paint the picture around we're underestimating Naeem Hines. We're underestimating Mo Ali Cox and we're underestimating creatively getting the ball into the hands of your playmakers. Frank Reich has proven year after year that's what he knows how to do. So when you talk about Paris Campbell returning, Zach Pascal's still there, Michael Pittman's there, you you use Naeem Hines like crazy last season. Jonathan Taylor can catch the football. Mo Ali Cox is a mismatch. I didn't say T.Y. Hilton's name because I think he's he, he may be irrelevant. Like, he's probably – and it, coming from me, this is hard. But I think you waste a pick on T.Y. Hilton because you don't have a ceiling. And he's not going up. He's going down. So he, he feels like drafting somebody 
extremely late in his career with no real upside for your team, that isn't going to be the focal point. Like, I don't think Frank Reich is going into the year building the focal point of the Indianapolis Colts offense around T.Y. Hilton the way that the Andrew Luck offense would have been three or four years ago. I think he is. It's If we got him, cool. We're going to use him. But we might not, so let's use all these other pieces. Okay, that's that's fair. Looking at last year, the fact that T.Y. Hilton wasn't great, um, and they definitely spread the ball around. The question is whether or not Carson Wentz is able to do what Phillip Rivers did in, in finding the, the, the pieces. Um, last year's leading tight end target uh, share guy for this team, Trey Burton, is gone. Yeah. Is there an opportunity here for one of the tight ends to actually step up in this division? It's uh, Mo Alley Cox. It would be Mo Alley Cox for you yeah. over Jack Doyle? Yeah. And it, I mean, if you wanted to say Ferkser versus Cox on picking a, a diamond, yeah. I would take Mo Alley Cox. I would as well because Ferkser does not have an athletic profile or physical ability to really make something on his own. We've seen some flashes. Diamond. Brilliant. So humongous. Well, you see, it's the size, Jason. Is he's enormous? He he. I don't I don't understand because he you know on paper he's the same size as other big tight ends, but then you go stand next to each other. I don't. Maybe it's because he. You know wears, how you say Mike has such a giant head. You, but yeah, I do. There's there's. I mean, obviously he has. It's right, because of because his of head science. Size. Uh, yeah, mathematics ratios. Mm -hmm. Moali Cox hasn't beat. Oh, for sure, but not proportionally. But like, correct. I mean his. Do you think, like, helmet size, we don't, uh, we've got this helmet kind of as a barometer in the middle of the table. No chance. Could his helmet fit on this table? Mo Ali Cox's? Mo Ali Cox's helmet? I don't think so. I doubt it, but. He plays like Dark Helmet. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, Dark Helmet. Um, good reference. Uh, no, I think Mo Ali Cox could emerge, and I think it is an interesting exercise for fantasy players to put Hilton out the door, mentally, okay. and say, what does the offense look like? Because if you do that, and you trust Frank Reich, you have to then make assumptions about other players. You can't say Michael Pittman's taken over. Like There was nothing on film last year that tells me Michael Pittman is ready to be an alpha in this offense, personally. He had, he had tons of plays designed for him that were within a... Uh, maybe he expands everything this year and becomes a focal point, maybe. But to me, it's like, okay, how do they get it done? And that's where I, I think you probably don't dismiss Naeem Hines as a spot start for fantasy purposes here and there. Uh, he was the RB10 from week eight on last year. He finished at RB19, and we're quick to say, no, Hilton's the, the key to the offense. It's not the RB19. Well, I mean, it, I think it's very similar to what we saw in um, Los Angeles last year when Rivers left. You, I personally discounted Austin Eckler because the dump-offs might not be there as much. Carson Wentz is known to miss running backs right in front of him from time to time, uh, both in – not seeing them open or not being able to hit them in the hands. But wasn't the lesson that we were wrong? What do you mean? We were completely wrong about Eckler's target share. Because as soon as he had a chance to play with Justin Herbert, he was well, targeted yes. all over the place because he's one of the better players on the offense. Sure. we. I mean, the, the argument was Tyrod Taylor, which we only got to see one game. But in that game, he got one target. Um, so too small of sample size. Um, but I, I want to circle back real quick. I actually think Michael Pittman is a fine draft pick this year because he's one of those guys where he either takes a second-year leap and maybe he is the focal point of the offense or becomes the wide receiver one uh, for a winning franchise. He was, you know, I think he had a pretty good first year, over 500 yards. He was injured for three games during the early part of the season. And now the opportunity with a kind of on-the-way-out T.Y. Hilton is there. For an eleventh round pick, you cut him in week one if you don't want. But the, there is a path that I see for Pittman, and I loved his college tape. Oh, I I don't disagree that he's he's a great player. What's funny is they have their own Tim Patrick on this team. They have their Tim Patrick. Is that Zach Pascal? It's Zach Pascal who yeah. who who had more targets and more receptions than Michael Pittman did last year. But we just don't even talk about him. Well, because the upside isn't there with them. Like, if, if Pascal gets 100 targets this year, you're probably not playing him much for fantasy. <laughs> Last year, he was four. Uh, who is that? Michael Pittman was 40 for 503 and one. Pascal was 44 for 629 and five. So he actually was far more productive, completely ignored. And then people want to know, does Paris Campbell have any shot? I'm always anti-Paris Campbell. Right, um, that's just a thing. That's just a thing since college, but... Um, 
if T.Y. Hilton is out and someone needs to step up, the narrative I just spoke for Michael Pittman is true for Paris Campbell. Um, now, before we leave the Colts, the biggest question here. Well, you know what happens when you leave the Colts where you have to go, too. Yeah, we got to go to the bottom of the division. Yeah. Yeah. So let's stay on the Colts a little longer. Uh, <laughs> Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor is my least favorite fantasy player this year because I absolutely adore and love you love him and you're not going to get him his talent I think he is otherworldly I mean last year he was my number one uh, by a wide margin talent wise it just was drooling from what he could do and now he showed it he he flashed brilliantly but he's being drafted so high that I can't ever get myself like I don't believe he's going to finish as the running back six or higher and I'm torn because I really, truly believe he's talented enough to be the number one running back in, in all of football, but and he's got a great offensive line, but I just don't think he's going to get the targets, and it, it, like you said, Naeem Himes will be involved. Marlon Mack is back from his injury. It's just tough for me to pull the trigger that early in a draft, but I love the guy, so I don't know what to well, do. Well, it's so ridiculous because it's the invert of last year between us. Right. Like, I was the one pumping the brakes on Jonathan Taylor – worried about over-investing in your drafts on him and you guys were you know all right. over him and now we're now I have him ranked the highest and yeah I mean the the, the Philip Rivers question obviously he's a check down king um I think you're right I mean Herbert we didn't get to see enough of him and Eckler together but when you have a talented player you need to target them Frank Reich's a smart coach so Last year, you know, 40 receptions. If you can give me 40. Yeah. Oh, that would be great. If you if you say that Jonathan Taylor is going to get 40 receptions this year, then he's a lock top 10 back, and he has the potential to be top So five. So maybe that's the bet you're making when you decide to draft him over a Zeke or somebody like that. Like, you're, you're betting on – like, that was his 17-game pace last year with Phillip Rivers was 40. And that was with him having, lim you know, less of the running back snaps in the first half of the year. So there is some hope there. Do you get – you want to talk about the Houston Texans now? Oh man, that's funny to. It's almost insulting to the Jaguars. I don't to know, look, talk about the Texans ahead of them, but we're just doing this in order of last year's record. They won but it four feels, games. It feels wrong. They won four games. Three of the four were against Detroit, and two against Jacksonville. So Jacksonville, at the bottom of the division, lost twice to the Houston Texans. But what do you think their win total is this year? They were four and twelve last year. What do you think Vegas has them at? Oh, man. I, I'm surprised there's even a line allowed uh, with the Deshaun Watson question. I, it's got to be four and a half, something super low. You're good today, Jason. It's four. Okay. It's four wins. Uh, they were 31st in terms of covering the spread last Isn't year. Isn't just a bet? You have to. Like, I'm not, I'm not you know, uh, I'm not the sports betting uh, expert here. But, like, what do you put the odds that Deshaun Watson plays football this year? I... Uh, Football on any team football, or on the Texans? Just football. Eight games. Eight games of football this year Tw in the National Football League. Eight games of football this year, I'll put it 40%. Yeah, that's a very large chunk because obviously if he played eight games for the Texans, they're going to win more than their four Their line the would year. not be four games. Well, here, here's the irony is they start the year against Jacksonville. So you could go make that bet in Vegas and watch them win week one against Jacksonville at home against a rookie quarterback. Mm-hmm. Which could absolutely happen. I, I doubt that line in that game has Jacksonville's favorite. Who's home? Houston. Oh, man, that'll be interesting. So you go make that bet, and Houston starts 1-0. <laughs> but uh, let's talk about this team because we, that's our job. <laughs> and we get to try to sift through the, the myriad of not Deshaun Watson on this roster and try to find some value it's easy to malign the Texans because of what's taken place, some outside of their control, some a lot within it. No more Will Fuller, Duke Johnson. Uh, no more Chad Hansen, Mbop. Probably no Deshaun Watson. They add Philip Lindsay. They had Mark Ingram. They had Re add Rex Burkhead to the running back room. And uh, they go and they draft their with their first pick, Davis Mills, a quarterback. 31st in rush attempts last year, 19th in points per game with Watson. I think I just don't see the path. Like if Tyrod Taylor's your starter, he averaged 18 completions a game throughout his career. Distributing 18 tie and we've had this why do we have this conversation every offseason? Why do we have to have the Tyrod Taylor offseason 
conversation every Be- year. Because he has a phenomenal agent. I don't know who it is, but my goodness, if you're going into the NFL draft and you're like, you're 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 an NFL caliber talent, but you're not a star. Go sign with Tyrod Taylor's agent because he keeps getting starting gigs every year after doing nothing. It's really impressive work, Agent Taylor. Yeah, it's his mother. <laughs> yeah, it's not what it was. I don't know. I mean, it, someone loves him a lot. So, and we, I just, it gets old because we spent the whole off season talking about what the Los Angeles offense would look like with him. Now we have to do it again with Houston. But I guess the saving grace is that there aren't a lot of players to talk about. There's not a lot of input. You're not looking at losing the Keenan Allen volume like you were last year thinking of Tyrod coming into no, there's Los only, Angeles. There's only two players that need to be brought up. And the only other reason you'd bring other names up is just in the context of how it might affect the two draftable options. That's David Johnson and Brandon Cooks. Um David Johnson is interesting. They have done their best job to crowd that backfield this offseason, bringing in Philip Lindsay, bringing in Mark Ingram, bringing in Rex Burkhead. But they've done this. A lot of times what I would say is look at their transactions. They need more from this position. But they did it with literally every position. They brought in like 40 players across all positions. that they just want competition everywhere, eventually this team has to they, – they can't carry 90 – five players into the season they're going to cut a lot of these guys and eventually these starters will just play football and that will be David Johnson it will and I that's where I'm at with this backfield is I would I'm pretty confident David Johnson gets the majority of the work in this offense and is the best and is the best player yes. like I think David Johnson at this stage in his career versatile going to be needed this defense is awful this offense will be awful but he catches the football and he is a he's still talented enough to give you something fantasy wise. Um and, and another player you're gonna say was Brandon Cooks, right? Yes. So those are the two offensive pieces. Do you are you willing at the right value to invest in one or both? Yeah, I mean uh, David Johnson certainly because he's a running back. Uh I've seen him falling very, very late in drafts. Uh you know, I've seen him in the eighth round. And and once you're past all those great awesome wide receiver options in rounds three through seven if I'm circling back to running back maybe I only have one or maybe I've got two by the eighth round of David Johnson sitting there you have a starter capable of catching the ball who looked good last year you you, you know he played the majority of the year last year he did miss four games um, but in the games he played there were only three times all season that he was outside the top 24 at the position now plenty of times he was in that RB2, he wasn't an all-star, win your week for you type of guy. But with volume and pass catching... He's going to be 10 or more when he starts. 10 or more. Oh, fantasy, fantasy points. points. I yes, think he'll, sure. be a, he'll be a 10... He'll be an old-school Clinton Portis uh, on Washington. Yeah, great where you, flex option. Where you just got 10 points no matter what. Yeah, I want, I want, I want 10 to 12 and a half points and not think about my second flex position. And we were, we were getting down in our Scotty Fishbowl draft looking at running back options, and he's falling, and, and for good reason, right? You don't have any confidence in the offense. But, I mean, I think we saw from James Robinson getting involved in the passing game last year on a team that didn't run a lot. I mean, Houston was 31st in rush attempts. Johnson was still good. Jacksonville was 32nd. And James Robinson was still good. So you can be a bad team. But you got to catch the football, and at least he has that skill set. Now, I will. It's it would be disingenuous of me not to bring up the Tyrod Taylor not throwing the ball much to the running back, uh, with a running back capable of catching the ball. Um, I think on the extremes, and and I've had some of this conversation and debate on Twitter recently over is throwing to the running back a quarterback stat? Is it a uh, talent stat? Is it a coaching stat? And I think on the extremes. Um, it is a it is a, a quarterback stat, um, not in the average. And Tyrod Taylor is on the extreme of that. He's not going to throw the ball a lot to David Johnson. So it's a matter of do we really believe Tyrod Taylor is going to be starting much of the season? Well, yeah, and I don't, you know, the talent is thin there. They have to throw to David Johnson, even if he's lined up in the slot. You know, I know th- you're right, I think, on the extremes, but on the average case, it's not a quarterback to me. I think we saw this plain and simple with the Cam Newton CMC situation. Sure, where, you get the player who can catch the ball, you throw him the ball. Yeah, and how you design your offense. But 
And not a lot. Let me let me put it this way: Do you have a lot of hope for Philip Lindsay? No. Do you have hope for Jordan Akins? No. Do you have hope for any of the other running backs in that room? Ingram, Burkhead, Nico no. Collins, Kiki QT. Um, dynasty Randall wise, Cobb says, "Hey, what's up?" Dynasty wise, Nico Collins is the only name that I would just throw out there, saying he's coming into an NFL experience where the opportunity and pathway is open for him. So if he comes in and seizes the day, he could be better than what we're expecting. Because uh, obviously, Nico Collins is not a highly drafted fantasy option, um, even in dynasty leagues. But at least the path is there for him. Jacksonville was one in fifteen last year. They won their first game of the season, if you remember. They beat the Colts. Which, once again, I spent the offseason disparaging Gardner Minshew and then was getting flexed on in week one. Oh, yeah, it was great. And, uh, well, they they lost the next 15 games. They went through Gardner and Luton and Glennon, which is – that's more of a – Glennon a, a and – A law firm than it is a quarterback room. <laughs> Glennon and Luton is a gluten for punishment. Uh oh, it, mm? Uh, mm? like you are okay. Mm? Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was gonna go like gluten free. Like they're gonna be gluten free this uh, that's year. That's too easy. Okay. Also, they had they were punished a lot last year. So. Yeah. Okay. I'm. Uh, I'll. It's I'll okay. give it's, myself it's a Saturday. C minus. It's Saturday. I won't yeah. even rank you. Thank you. It was a. I brought up the fact that James Robinson was great last year, which he was, and did it on the offense that was thirty second in rushing attempts. That is not the normal, though. Like, using him as the template for, well, bad teams produce good running backs is not the normal, at least if you're the dead last in rush attempts. Since 2011, there have been two that have put up big years, and that was Lamar Miller back in 2015 for Miami and James Robinson last year who finished seventh at the position. I think we've spent a lot of the offseason bemoaning Urban Meyer taking the first-round pick on ETN because of what it means for James Robinson managers because you had the free square at running back and then you decided to double down. Mm -hmm. But I, it to me, it I think you have to translate that into what this team wants to do. And what this team wants to do is throw the football to the running back position. They didn't feel like they were equipped enough with James Robinson. in la last year for Trevor Lawrence in college, highest percentage of attempts from screens, run pass options among all quarterbacks. Urban Meyer needed to double down on the ability to do it. Yeah, uh, and he brought in his college teammate that he's comfortable doing it with. James Robinson's season last year was awesome, and they should have stuck with him. They didn't, and James Robinson is borderline irrelevant to me. I, I, I don't know how far he has to drop in a draft for me to take him, uh, but it's far. I've, I've passed him in so many mocks and so many real drafts. He is everything I don't want in a player. Last year, he was great. I take nothing away from him. I give him all the credit, but it was entirely because he was the only thing, the only player touching the ball a bunch. It's like you said, they were dead last in rushing attempts, but he was great because he got all of them. It's similar to what we were talking about with the Steelers on the last episode. A lot of times people think that these running backs with a ton of rushing attempts are on a high rushing volume team. No, sometimes it's, it's just, just they're the only guy, and that's all it was. Well, he's not the only guy. He's not with the team and the coach and the staff that experienced him, and they just brought in a first-round running back. They want to throw the ball to the running back, and while James Robinson can do that, between the 20s, Urban Meyer wants speed. So let me let me ask you a couple questions. Pull up your stats for Jacksonville because I want to ask you a, a question about them because I do look at James Robinson a little bit like Philip Lindsay in year two where he forced his himself to the top of the depth chart and the team has no choice but to use him. I think he's going to be a part of the offense. Sure. So the question I have for you is do you think he'll have – do you think do you have two running backs on that team with more than 150 touches? I do not. So where do you have James Robinson then? I have James Robinson with 165 touches and Travis Etienne with 133. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, not touches, rushing touches. Yeah, I, I touches. Total, oh, then total both touches. both of them are over 150 touches. All right. So looking at every team over the last five years that have had two running backs with 150 touches each. Okay. So what I'm projecting for this team, you have 55 percent. 55% had both running backs that finished in the top 36. Only only 20 per, but only 21% had both in the top 24. So you're not going to get ceiling if they share the time. If they have the type of touch count that you have projected, you might 
get a couple of top 36s. Okay, so touchdowns for Robinson, catches for ETN, but you're not getting in the top 24. And and, and that's that's what we need to clarify for people here because when you say, "Hey, the, it, it's likely that they're both in the top 36." Really 50-50. That, yeah. that can sound but well, even if it's even if it was 100% guaranteed, that can sound better than it is. Um, because it's similar to saying, oh, uh, this tight end was the tight end seven. It's irrelevant. Like, if you're not in the top 25 running backs, you are usually irrelevant. Um, You'd be a nice two. Last year, the running back 36, just to give okay, you a barometer. Give me, give me some names for, from last that Last year's running back 36 was Giovanni Bernard. He wow. was a top okay. 36 running back. So, that's my So point. that's a health award. R ex exactly right. Or give, me, give me the 30th running back last season. The 30th that? was Chase Edmonds. Okay, yeah, I'm still not pleased. Daryl Henderson 28th? Jr. after that. Latavius Murray, Adrian Peterson. Okay, like, give me 25. Who's 25? Oh, we're going on. Okay, up. I'm sure that's better. James Conner was 25, and you weren't probably right. thrilled. Well, My I, point look, is confidence wanes as you get into that range. You just said it's very unlikely that they're in the top 24. Very unlikely. If they're not in the top 24, I don't really care I I do, think at that, running back. I think we're learning something here today. Good. That's our that's our goal. <laughs> um, I have been very verbose about my dislike of DJ Chark. I believe he's a bust. I believe he will not be part of their future. I am not excited. I will draft LaVisca Chenault two rounds after him every day of the week and uh, twice on Saturday since that's today's show. And then Marvin Jones has a good shot at outperforming DJ Chark. I believe they brought him in specifically because they didn't feel like they had enough at the wide receiver position from Chark on film, wasn't with Urban Meyer. Chark and Marvin Jones Jr. are ironically very similar stylistic assets on a football now, why field. why would you do that? Why would you bring in a similar player? Because you want that position and you don't think you have it. Right. And, yeah, I, I would agree with you. I, I would prefer both of them. I've, I've come around to your line of thinking DJ Chark in the seventh is not something that I – really want um there are much better higher odds of finishing like Cortland Sutton in the seventh would oh you take him? my goodness do I love Devontae Smith in the seventh yeah give me both those guys over DJ Chark Robbie Anderson doubt. in the eighth oh baby yes I'm assuming you take Will Fuller in Miami in the eighth. sure absolutely yeah. oh it's certainly over DJ Chark so uh not Chark week no for the footballers today I'm not sure where Mike is on Chark. I don't know if I persuaded him or not it's hard. I think I did. Yeah, I would say this. It's hard to be pro Chark. The argument for it is that we did see a breakout where he had a stretch of games with touchdowns and yes, showed flashes where he can get it done on an NFL field. He is, un, you know, inarguably fast. He is uh, an elite speedster on the NFL field, um, and he's young. So someone's got to you know step up. But the reality is someone doesn't have to step up in Trevor Lawrence's rookie season. Well, and you might see him step up week one against Houston. Like, you may see the best from the Jacksonville offense early. That game is going to be a deception bowl of what these teams really are because they're going to – two of the worst defenses in football facing off head-to-head -head in week one. Headlines for Lawrence. Everybody's eyes are going to be on him. And so how much are you rooting for that as a dynasty manager of DJ Chark? Just a week one explosion. So you can with, ship him out? Yeah, oh yeah. With Trevor Lawrence. I mean, because you could probably you're gonna get some people saying this is the new You're gonna get everybody, including me, probably saying that because it's gonna be hard not to believe if Lawrence picks Chark out for two touchdowns in week one, you tell I may lose all my conviction. I'm gonna be honest with you. Stick with it, Andy. Trade him. Trade high. It's going to be – I'll look like an idiot. Trade hey, high. The best part will be it'll he'll pull the Gardner Minshew. He'll come out, he'll dominate, you'll laugh at me, and then everyone will ignore the next 15 weeks. That's the – that's like my favorite thing. To laugh at me? Well, just to laugh at you even when you're right. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah. Um. All right, who wins the division? I'm going to – after going through this, I'm changing. I thought I was going to go Colts. I'm going to go Titans. All right. I will go with the Colts. Toughest player to project in the division? Jonathan Taylor just tears my heart apart. Okay. And I, I would say Carson Wentz is in that category too. Like we, I, I guess we didn't really talk about Wentz's fantasy value, which, I mean, we've talked about it on the show in the past. We will in the future. But um, ceiling. Just give me the – we'll close with that. The ceiling for Carson Wentz is – Quarterback seven. 
Okay. Yeah, I think that's fair. He was, by the way, for those going, what? That's what he was during the beginning of the year last year. Yeah. Through his seven starts. Yeah, he's better for fantasy than he is for real life. Sneaky player for 2021. Sneaky dynasty ad out of this group. I have mine. You'll hate it. I have mine. I'll love it. Jordan Akins. Oh, gross. Grody. Uh, you are right. Mine is a little bit bigger than him. Same position. He's gigantor. <laughs> Mo Alley Cox. All right. That'll do it for today's podcast. Hope you enjoyed the breakdown. More divisional breakdowns next week. The bear will be gone. The hairy, tattooed beast will be back. Goodbye, Footland. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.